So I finished my PhD in AI. I, it was on a program to play chess in games. And in those days, chess was a sort of a killer app for AI. The reason was that computers were not very powerful and they just could not do the kind of search that's needed to figure out which move to make. And so that was why I was working in that area for my PhD topic. Anyway, I finished my PhD and nobody was willing to offer me a good job as a faculty member. Uh, and so I ended up going back to Boston and working for the same company that I had worked for originally, MITRE Corporation. Uh, it was all my husband's fault because <laughs> I, I wanted to move back to Boston because he lived there. Um, so I got to MITRE and it was actually uh, very fortunate that I did not go on to a faculty position right away because it's not easy to start up as a new member of the faculty and at the same time and you're teaching courses and you have all these obligations and you're also trying to change fields. And I was making a major change of field from AI into computer systems. And being at MITRE gave me the freedom to do this. I was in a research position now and the first project I worked on was a time-sharing system, which time-sharing was a hot topic at the time. And um, I worked on that for a couple of years. And then um, I was at MITRE and they do research for the government. And I was asked to look into this problem that the government was interested in, namely what to do about the software crisis. So the software crisis was people would build big programs and they wouldn't work, they spend hundreds of man, you know, hundreds of, of millions of dollars, hundreds of man years, and in the end they'd have to scrap the whole thing. And actually, in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you could read in the newspaper about these fiascos, companies such and such, you know, spend all this money, and now they've had to throw the whole thing away. So the software crisis was a really big problem, and I was asked to start thinking about this. And so I started to look into this field, it's called programming methodology, of course, I read all the papers that existed, and there were some really good people working in that field. There was Edsker Dykstra, Tony Hoare, Dave Parnas. I mean, these were very good people, and they were writing papers about how do you break up a program into pieces so that you can reason about it. The problem that they were worried about was software programs are huge. They were huge then, you know, millions of lines of code. They're even bigger today. There's no way that you can make sense of something that big. You have to have a way of breaking it up into small pieces that you can work on independently, reason about independently, and that somehow you put the whole thing together and it works. And nobody knew how to do that. So they were talking about things they called modules, but Parna said, I don't know what they are. There's these things called modules, but I don't know how to describe them. And they were also worrying about how do you do design? And uh, Nicholas Virat wrote a paper about top-down design, and he sort of talked about it, but it was unrelated to the software structure that existed underneath. Anyway, I read all these papers, and I realized that I had invented a software methodology when I was working on my first project, the Venus system, uh, because that was a complicated project at the time, and I was very worried about how my small team of programmers would manage to build all that software and have it work in a short period of time. And so what I did was I sort of broke the rules in the way that programs were being built at the time. In those days, there tended to be lots of global variables and then lots of code, and the code interacted through the global variables. And that didn't actually work all that well. So what I decided to do was to say that I was gonna not have any global variables, I was gonna partition them into discrete units, and there would be some code responsible for each partition and the only way that code can interact with one another and that you can get access to the globals was by calling operations that the partition that was in charge of those globals provided for you. So I had this notion of what I called a partition or a multi-operation module that had some data hidden inside and a bunch of operations that you would use to interact with that. And I wrote this up. So Which that is was sort of a fundamental concept you encounter in a CS 106A class. Well, we hadn't quite got there yet, though. So this was at MITRE. So yeah. here I am at MITRE, and meanwhile I had written a paper on my operating system, Venus, and I submitted to SOSP, which is the top conference in computer in systems, and I presented it at this conference, and unknown to me, uh, there were people from MIT kind of looking for women. So what had happened is Title IX was on the verge of being passed, 
And Title IX, although it has to do with athletics, mm -hmm. actually started to open the door for women. And the president of MIT, Jerry Wiesner, I think was interested in having them hire some women. And the electrical engineering department, which was all that existed at that point, had gotten the message. And so they were kind of looking. And the chair of my session was a professor at MIT, and there were a couple of other senior professors in the audience. And as a result of this talk, they asked me to apply for a faculty position. And so I moved to MIT in the fall of 1972. And this was actually a really good time to make this move for me, because at that point, I was totally wrapped up in the programming methodology question. In particular, I wanted to understand what can we do to help people figure out how to break their problem when they're doing design into a bunch of modules that make sense. And nobody knew how to do that. And the benefit of being a professor was that I could do my own, I could define my own research direction. And I had a research direction that I was really interested in pursuing.